I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this morning. I have, um, I just want to bring to your attention that there are several announcements outlined in your bulletin. Please take a look at those things on the opposite side of the announcements um, is the prayer list. And there are a number of folks that are on our prayer list. We hope that you will take this schedule home and post it on your refrigerator and then take it down when you do your personal prayer and devotional time and be in prayer for um, those folks who are mentioned and for those who are known only to you and those known only to God. Um, in the bulletin as well as in the pew pockets, we do have attendance cards. Please take a moment to fill out an attendance card and if you've had a change of address or telephone number or email lately, please let us know so that we can make sure that we get that updated. On the reverse side, if you have prayer concerns, um, you can share those with us. Uh, new members will be received at the end of September on the 24th. So if you are interested in uniting with this congregation, you can talk to me or our clerk of session, John Bossenbrook, and we will get that on our agenda. And I'm gonna ask Amy Huffman to go ahead and start making her way up here. Um, also in September, we will resume our grief share programming on Wednesday evenings from six until eight. Uh, with dinner and then uh, video and discussion programming. And Amy would like to share a few words about her experience in this group. Morning, um, I'm Amy Huffman, a member of Christ Presbyterian Church for 22 years, uh, mother of three children, Christopher, Nick, and Lauren. Uh, in the past two years, a uh, widow after losing uh, Tim, also a member of the church. We moved here from Kansas City. Uh, Chris and Nick were two and four, and then Lauren came along in 2006 and was baptized here. Uh, she's now a senior um, and is in the youth group. Uh, she's been in the youth group along with Janet and Bob, who were instrumental in her growth and support these past two years uh, with the loss of her father. Uh, Tim and I were together 31 years. He was an active member of CPC. Uh, most recently as elder and youth leader with Janet and Bob Lighty. Uh, most importantly, he was a very active father with his three children. Tim passed away suddenly uh, with no prior warning of a pulmonary embolism uh, age 53 in July of 2021. Uh, he left a hole in our hearts and lives uh, in lives that seem impossible to fill and at times still it feels that way. Shortly after this, I heard about the grief share. Uh, how he approached me about it, but I just really wasn't ready. Um, but this past year, in September, um, I did attend the 10-week session. Um, and as uh, Pastor Ruth indicated, this year the grief share starts September 6th through September 10th. Um, it's a great praise place to discover uh, your faith and your fellowship. Uh, each week starts out with a dinner. Um, then it's followed by fellowship. We do a video and group discussion or just listening. Um, it allows you to meet others who have lost, whether it be a spouse, a parent, a friend, a child. Um, it gives you a chance to improve your new normal. I learned through these classes that I was still very stuck and not fully embracing life. The classes helped me see that. So give it a try, again, to September 6th on Wednesday, 6 to 8, for 10 weeks. Whether it's been a year or even longer, seven to, seven, seven to 10 years, you can still benefit from hearing other people's grief journeys. Let me end with this. I saw it on a daily calendar yesterday. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, John 10 through 10. He didn't say an easy life. He didn't say a self-indulgent life where all your wishes are granted. He didn't say a life free from pain, but he did say a full life. One of joy, peace, love, and hope. It's not only possible, it's promised. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Amy. Um, 
As relates to that, um, our youth are grieving uh, Janet's departure um, from youth ministry, and I just want to tell you that Todd is actually in Texas right now and had dinner with Janet and Barb on uh, Friday evening. They miss us terribly. They send their love. And so on the count of three, if everybody would say, hey, Janet and Barb, that would be really great. And I'll give Larry just a second to set the camera so that we can, you all can wave. Um, and he's going to give me a high sign. Um, she's got orientation this way. Okay, here we go. You ready? One, two, three. Hi, Janet and Barb. Thank you. Um, grief comes in many, many different ways, and it's not just the loss of an individual or um, a loved one, but it comes in change. And so um, there's a lot of change that's going on here. So um, please be mindful that grief comes out in many different ways um, over many different uh, paths and experiences. My friends, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Join me in the call to worship. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come. God will bring us to the holy mountain, a house of prayer for all people. God gathers all the outcasts together and makes us joyful.
In the Reformed tradition, when we worship, we confess not only our own sin, but that of the world, in the confidence that God's grace will abound. Hear the call to confession. We call to God, saying, Have mercy on us. We call to God, saying, Lord, help us. We call to God even in the midst of our sin, knowing that God is gracious and just. Join me in the prayer of confession. God of all goodness, we do not want to face all that is in our own hearts. We want to focus on the good, on the love, the compassion, the care, and ignore the bad, the greed, the envy, the cruelty. But before you, God, we must face it. Forgive all the ways we have let evil take hold in our hearts. Cleanse us. Help us face our own demons and empower us to live a Christ-like life. We have been disobedient to God, but we have received mercy. Let us live our lives as those transformed by the abundant mercy of God. be with you all. all Invite you to turn to those around you and offer a sign of the peace. Guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson comes from Matthew chapter 14, or 15, verses 10 to 28. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and that is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. 
My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of God for the people of God. And speed to God. It's the C5. I'll put it back where I got it. So um, I'll invite the children to come forward for a time just especially for them. Or you can just stay right here. That's fine. You guys know what this is? It's a handbell, right? What do you use a handbell for? To play? Oops. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, it works. Um, what, what happens if you do, I mean, when do you see bells during the year? Who do you see bells? Yeah. yeah, sometimes at Christmas. Who do you see ringing bells? Did you ever see somebody standing at a kettle with a, a big red kettle and they're collecting money and, and they're ringing their bell to try to, to try to what? What are they doing? What are they doing? Are you getting your attention? There's something going on here, isn't there? Yeah? Have you ever made a mistake? Oops, sorry. Have you ever made a mistake? Oops, oh gosh, I did it again. Can I, can I, take, can I take it back? Can I, can I unring this bell? Why not? Because you can't, oh, because, because you can't take it back. You can't unring the bell and take, I mean, you could. You, you could ring it backwards. But you can't take back the ring of the bell. So what I want you to think about is when we make mistakes, you can't take it back, can you? All you can do is go forward, right? So when we talk about sin, we talk about mistakes that we make. You can't take them back. But the grace is, do you know what grace is? Do you know what grace is? Grace is that being able to move forward even after you've made a mistake. So now what Mrs. Whitaker just read a minute ago is, do you think Jesus ever made mistakes? Yeah, maybe, maybe, because he was fully human. I mean, he's just like us, right? Except here's the thing. I think Jesus came to point out our mistakes. And so what happened was this last little bit of the story, were you listening? Jesus was moving on with his disciples, and there was this woman who was not part of the same tribe of people that Jesus was. She is from a not-so-popular part of the, the society. And so Jesus and his disciples thought, well, Jesus has only come for us, right? Because that's what all the prophets had said before. Jesus is just for us. So this woman starts ringing her bell. Please, Jesus, my daughter is ill. You can heal her. And Jesus says, no. Please, Jesus. You can help her. No. 
I don't take the food from the table and give it to the dogs. And she says, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. She can't unring that bell, can she? And her argument makes perfect sense. And Jesus rings the bell and says, your daughter is healed. Great is your faith. Go on your way. This is the magic of grace. We can't escape it. And it's available because it's given freely. All we have to do is believe and receive it. What are you going to think about the next time you hear a bell ring? A story, yeah? And also how to unring a bell. You can't. So when Jesus rings that bell of giving a gift to somebody who's outside of the promise, he widened the circle to include others. Will you pray with me? I'll say a line, you say it after me. Dear God, thank you for handbells. Thank you for the attention that they bring. Thank you for not being able to unring a bell. Help us to know your grace and to share your love with the world as Jesus did including everyone. Amen. Okay, thank you. Join me in the responsive reading, which comes from Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their blood offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered.
from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. The word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, and the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. When I was in high school, I played water polo, and I made the cut because I was the only one stupid enough to say, sure, I'll play goalie. My junior and senior years of high school, I did much more with theater. And I never made the cut for a lead in any of the shows. But in the musicals, I always made the cut to be in the chorus. It was my great honor to play dead person number three in a show called Our Town. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. You had to sit for 45 minutes. Stick straight. Hardly breathing. But I did it because I could make the cut. I got to college made the cut, was in the chorus, even had a few speaking lines. But I never felt like I was good enough. Have you ever had a feeling that you're just not good enough, that people tell you enough times that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not cute enough, you're not enough? And so, after a while of hearing that, it bears out, and you stop being able to make the cut. Well, this is how it was back in Jesus' day. The Samaritan woman who approached him and asked for help to heal her daughter, by virtue of not being a member of the Jewish community, she did not make the cut by standard, by regulation, by prophetic proclamation. She did not fit the bill. And yet, she went to Jesus and rang her bell. Lord, help I know that you can help. But Lord, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table of the children. And Jesus says, you know what? You're right. Congratulations, you made the cut. Your daughter's healed. People don't know what to make of that story because it is a moment of bell ringing. It is what some would call a bellwether moment. Jesus came for the Jews and their redemption and salvation and yet also 
to include all of the nations of the world. And if you look, you'll find it in the words of the prophets. They are written on subway walls and tenement halls, as well as in scripture. The story of Jesus is not always a story about rules and regulations, but it is a story of grace and mercy freely given, especially given to those who have spent their lives not being able to make the cut. In the 1930s, in Europe, People who made the cut had blonde hair and blue eyes. People who didn't make the cut were sent off to death camps. In the 60s, the song says, long-haired freaky people need not apply. They didn't make the cut. During the civil rights era, People with different skin tones did not make the cut. And yet by faith, by faith in Christ, we are brought together as one body around the world. All people gathered in because of this one bellwether moment in the ministry of Jesus that says, I am not here for just one people. I am here for all people. And you, lady dog of society, you make the cut. You get grace. And you, tax collector, sinner, you get grace. And you, and you, and you, and all of you, you make the cut. You get grace. And in Paul's letter to the church at Rome, he talks about, has God rejected God's own people? No. God has not rejected us. God has simply included the others. It is what is called grace. And the gift of grace is irrevocable. You can't give it back. You can only receive it. And for us, in our sinful condition as humans, God has ordained mercy for all of us. Now, um, in my study for today, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you just a little bit about one of my favorite stories in the history of the world. It is a little book called Les Miserables. And it is a story of a man who served 19 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his hungry family. When he comes out of the galleys and is given his yellow passport, which marks him as someone who does not make the cut for society for the rest of his life, he makes his way. And he says, I have knocked on every door and people turn me away at every door. The person sharing the park bench with him says, have you tried that door? Indicating the door of the church. You should try that door. Woman opens the door. She calls the Monsignor, and the Monsignor says, oh my, we have company. Set the table, light the silver candlesticks, pull out the good silver dishes. We have a guest. And this man, Jean Valjean, 
receives a gift of kindness that is almost unbelievable to him. And as they settle him in for the night, the bishop says to him, rest well. Valjean has other things on his mind and in his heart. He figures he can get a tidy sum for those silver candlesticks that were on the table. And so in the dark of night, he steals into the dining room, takes the silver candlesticks, puts them in his satchel, and he makes his way into the dark night, only to be captured by the police later, who then show up at the church door saying, Monsignor, we found this man and he has stolen your candlesticks. And Valjean knows he's going back to prison and hard labor. And the bishop in his kindness says, my friend, these are a gift. Officers, thank you for doing your job, but also my friend, you left without taking the silver plates. Here they are, put them in your satchel and go in peace. This is a bellwether moment in the life of Jean Valjean. Yeah, he messes up another time, but then, but then everything he does the rest of his life is an act of redemption, sanctification, and salvation. It is a transformation about how one act of love and grace can make the difference in someone's entire life. Pope Francis, in a speech at the Extraordinary Jubilee of God's Mercy in Bogota, said these words. He said, we live in a society that is bleeding, and the price of its wounds normally ends up being paid by the most vulnerable. But it is precisely to this society, to this culture, that the Lord sends us. He sends us with one program alone, to treat one another with mercy, to become neighbors to those thousands of defenseless people who walk in our beloved American land by proposing a different way of treating them. This is what grace and mercy look like. I can tell you what grace and mercy look like here at Christ Presbyterian Church. Grace and mercy looks like a corner meal served on Monday evenings to anyone who shows up. No questions asked, places at the table made, tables extended, food in abundance. You get a meal and one to take home, sometimes. Grace looks like taking meals to deliver to some of our folks who cannot get out on a Monday evening. So this faithful cadre of drivers and volunteers shows up dutifully every Monday evening and they drive dinner to recipients across town. Grace looks like people gathering at an ungodly hour of 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning in late September to sow hope by putting food boxes together. Talk to the community committee. Bob Burnett is here. If you have questions about that, late September, Saturday. That's what grace looks like. Grace looks like welcoming the stranger. Grace looks like smiling at a complete and total stranger as you hold the door open for them, walking in or out of a business. Grace looks like a lot of things, but grace is not something that we can earn. Grace is something that we can receive.
grace is something that we can offer, but we cannot earn it and put it in the bank and have it gain interest for us. Costly grace, as Bonhoeffer calls it, confronts us with a call to follow Jesus. It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. We cannot bless ourselves with God's grace, nor can we withhold a blessing from others. Martha Highsmith makes this observation. She says God's gifts are freely given by God who acts in sovereign love, not something we can give to or even claim for ourselves. Grace is God's alone to offer, and God offers it, it seems, to all people, the Jew and the Gentile, the ins and the outs, the faithful and the disobedient. My friends, everybody makes the cut to receive God's grace. Theologian Frederick, Frederick Buechner defines grace in this delightful little volume called Wishful Thinking. He says, grace is something you can never get but only be given. There is no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good luck, good looks or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. Have you ever tried to love somebody? A crucial eccentricity, Beekner continues, of the Christian faith is the assertion that people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. And there's nothing you have to do. The grace of God means something like, here's your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. Beekner points out there's just one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can only be ours if we reach out and receive it. May we know God's grace, and may we share that grace and mercy with the world, remembering that everyone makes the cut. Amen and amen. God welcomes all, strangers and friends. God's love is strong. I'll sing it once, then invite you to join it, uh, me and singing a number of times after that.
stand as you are able and let us declare what we believe using these words from a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to eternal life. You may be seated. Recognizing that all that we have and all that we are comes from God, in our response to God's grace, let us now give back to God our gifts and our offerings. Will the ushers please come forward? Loving God, for the gifts you have given in abundance and for the grace you have shared with us, 
We respond by giving you these, our gifts, multiply them, and use them for the mission and ministry of your church according to your will and your way. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's children say, Amen. You may be seated. Loving God, we come to you in this sweet hour of prayer, knowing that Jesus loves us for everything in the Bible tells us so, that you yourself are love. Lord, we come to you in prayer this day, asking on behalf of the world behalf of those we know and on behalf of those we do not know. We pray for our nation that is weary from wildfires, weary of woe and destruction, death and loss. Oh Lord, grief abounds, chaos abounds. And yet the light of your love shines through. The light of hope shines in the midst of despair. And it comes in people bringing food, bringing relief, bringing water. It comes in the faces of those gathered together, supporting one another the strong supporting the weak, and as the weak gain strength, they in turn support those who are weaker. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Hawaii and for those in Southern California and Arizona and Nevada who are in the path of Hurricane Hillary. Lord, fire and water, essential elements, for living and also powerfully destructive. Help your people, O Lord, and help us. Send us to share the light of your love with the world. We pray for war-torn parts of the world, for Niger, for Ukraine, for Russia. Lord, we pray for your people for all of the earth's peoples are your people. Beloved children, and these are who we pray for. 
We ask your blessings on us, O oh God, and on your church, that we would be inspired to live out the commandment of Christ to love one another and to share your love with the world. Lord, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples that in every prayer we approach you with the boldness of children saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to please stand as you are able and let us sing together our closing hymn. My friends, by God's grace, we all make the cut. No one is out of the reach of God's love and grace. So go out in that confidence, knowing that as you do, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us now and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.